So good safety habits. <clears throat> Before you begin any session of electroacupuncture, make sure your device is turned off. So you pick up your device, you look at your intensity controls, and you actually touch them. Make sure they're all turned off. They have that little audible click on the Pantheon when it's in the zero position, and you can feel there's, there's resistance there. You can't turn it further. Make sure those are off. Um, the other thing is on the ones that have the acupuncture tin switch, make sure that switch is set on acupuncture. If it's a high-low switch, make sure it's on low. So you're delivering the, the correct waveform, the correct intensity to the patient for electroacupuncture. And then you want to look and see, you've decided what mode you're going to use, what frequency. You want to make sure your, your device is set to all of those before you begin hooking the thing up to the patient. Then you perform the manual battery test, tells you your battery's good, you're good to go. Okay. Big topic here, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. <sighs> Cautions and contraindications of electroacupuncture. This machine has no brain. Use your own. I love this sign. Machine can't tell you if you should be using it on that particular patient. You're going to have to make that determination as a practitioner. And it is important to, um, to know all of these contraindications. So, of course, you're only going to use disposable needles. That's what we do anyway, right? Uh, we're only going to use a reputable electro device that we know is working properly. Pantheon, Edo, some other device that has a good reputation. Make sure that you thoroughly understand how to use that device. You've pre-tested it. You know that it works properly. You know, you're not just grabbing something off the shelf of a new clinic that you've never been in before and the device you've never used before and going in to use it on a patient. Uh, I would never do that with a patient. You want to make sure you're getting a written uh, consent form signed by the patient that includes Electro in it. And then the other thing, and I think a lot of people miss this, you don't want the patient to have electronic devices attached to them. And so these days, cell phones, smartphones, hearing aids, uh, iPods, Bluetooth devices, uh, there's more and more ways that people are getting their bodies wired up. Uh, and if they have those, and also if they have implanted electronic devices like pacemakers, you, you can't use electroacupuncture. But if it's a removable device, uh, like an iPod or a, or a cell phone, get that away from the patient. Take it, set it aside. Um, I had patients who want to hang, hang on to their smartphone all the time. No, you can't do that. Set it aside. You don't know how an electronic device might interact with electroacupuncture. So just be cautious. Put it aside. Here are some absolute contraindications. These are things you never want to use electroacupuncture with. So one of the big ones is cardiac pacemakers or any other implanted electronic device. Um, it's, it's, there's a great potential that electroacupuncture could interact with some implanted device, so you don't want to take that chance. You don't use electroacupuncture on those individuals. Um, patients in the first trimester of pregnancy, when the pregnancy is vulnerable, no electro, um, or on the low back or abdomen in any stage of pregnancy. Patients with a history of seizures should not have electroacupuncture. And you don't want to use it on children under 12 years old, especially on the heads, in the head area. Because you might trigger a seizure in a child who's never had one, but has a, might have a propensity, and you were the trigger then. Or electroacupuncture was the trigger. You don't want to try that. And then, of course, the patient's in shock or coma or any other altered state of consciousness, it's probably not a good idea to be using electroacupuncture. Some other contraindications are with acute febrile diseases, and you don't want to put it anywhere on the chest of a patient with heart problems. You want to avoid, these are things you just want to avoid in general, 
on all patients. You don't want to cross the midline of the head, the neck, throat area, or the upper back or the chest, because that's where the heart is. You don't want to be crossing a circuit across that area. You can be on one side of the head, you can be on one side of the neck, you can be on one side of the back or one side of the chest, but you don't want to cross. You want to avoid the carotid sinus area, and the throat, the larynx area, because you could cause a spasm in that area with electro. Not a lot of reason you would go there anyway, but you don't want to, you don't want to put electroacupuncture in that area. You don't want to use it around tumors. Uh, a person has a tumor, you don't want to be putting electro through there. Uh, or infections, uh, a badly infected open sore. <clears throat> Unspin un unstable spinal segments, also not a good idea, or recent fractures or sprains. You just want to avoid putting electroacupuncture around those areas. You don't want to cause muscle contractions where there's an unstable spinal segment or where there's a fracture or sprain that you might actually cause another con uh, contra muscle contraction that would make it worse. Being cautious. Now, here's some just some cautions. These are relative contraindications. So you want to be cautious. If someone comes to you with an undiagnosed pain and swelling in an area of their body. They might have a fracture. They fell, they injured themselves, they want you to treat the pain. Um, I would not want to treat it with electroacupuncture until I knew whether or not there was um, a fracture there. And in fact, might not even want to use acupuncture until I know there's a fracture. Send them to the doctor, get an x-ray. Older deficient patients, you have to be cautious about over-sedating, um, using constant mode, using high frequency or high intensity. You could over-sedate an older patient and they could be, um, they could, they could, you could lower their level of consciousness. It could cause them problems uh, for a time. It would, they'd probably come out of it and get over it, but it could cause problems for a while. Hypertensive patients, so they, they have come in to you with high blood pressure. You don't want to hook them up to high-frequency electroacupuncture. You just need to be cautious about certain types of patients. You know, severely obese patients are going to require a lot more current uh, to feel electroacupuncture. It might be difficult to get a reaction, so I would be cautious about that. And then in the presence of any electronic monitoring equipment, so you're in a hospital setting, patient is hooked up to... Uh, uh, monitors. I don't think I would use electroacupuncture on them. Uh, acupuncture would be fine, but not electro in that setting. So can electroacupuncture affect the heart? Um, could it cause a heart problem in someone who's otherwise healthy, in other words? And I don't believe it can. Um, the levels of electroacupuncture, you know, it's always under 250 micro or milliamps. That's, that would be really high, in fact. Um, and anything under that is safe. Um, and Dachi, you're getting Dachi with Electro at somewhere between 2.5 and 5 milliamps. You get the effect you want. Um, and most of the devices max out at around 30 milliamps. So you're not going to get to that range where you could actually cause a problem with the heart rhythm. However, you might have a person come in who has an undiagnosed cardiac condition and you could cause a problem with that person. This is why we avoid the chest or going across the chest or upper back area because you want to avoid causing any problems with the heart. So it's an excess of caution, you might say. So when do we choose to use electroacupuncture? Um, this is a choice that we make as acupuncturists. My rule of thumb is I start with manual acupuncture. I never start with electroacupuncture, or I should say I almost never start with electroacupuncture. Almost always try manual acupuncture first. See if that works, see what it does. Um, and then consider electroacupuncture for patients who don't respond well to manual acupuncture, especially severe or chronic pain, muscle atrophy, neurological damage or disorders, paralysis, sensory deficits, anxiety, depression, insomnia. These are the kind of conditions that respond really well to electroacupuncture and where if a patient comes in the door, 
I'm trying manual, I'm not getting anywhere, you know, or I'm not, or the patient's not getting better as quickly as they'd like to. I might go to, to electroacupuncture. I might go there fairly quickly if I see the right patient and I feel like they're going to benefit from it. And you kind of learn this by trying electroacupuncture and using it for a while to see who seems to respond best. And here's where you need to remember what it can do. So you're moving chi and blood and you can move it quite strongly with electroacupuncture. You can get a stronger da chi sensation, activate the sensory and motor neurons, activate those neurotransmitters, causes muscle contractions, you can cause muscle spasm, you can do a lot of things with it. And so you're choosing to use it based on what you want to achieve with that particular patient. And here's just another little chart. I think this is kind of useful to think about what we do in general with Chinese medicine. We have a range of choices. We can do from very light stimulation, Qigong, Reiki, healing touch, um, those kinds of things, all the way to point injection, bleeding cup, fire needle, various quasi-surgical techniques that are used in China mostly. Um, and then in between that, there's all kinds of things. There's acupressure, there's ear seeds, there's microcurrent, there's body work, gua sha, cupping, plum blossom, all these other types of sort of escalating stimulations. It's all about stimulating the person to heal themselves. And so we can, we can escalate that as quickly as we think it needs to be escalated. Typically, I'm starting with acupuncture. And then I may quickly escalate to ac electroacupuncture, or I may very slowly work my way up to that. Um, or I may not use electro at all if I don't think it's necessary. So choosing parameters. What do you choose? Millicurrent, microcurrent, mode, frequency, needle placement. There's a lot of choices we have to make. How do you decide? Um, sort of a rule of thumb chart. Millicurrent works better for most pain. Uh, or when you need a stronger stimulus. It works better for excess conditions and patients that seem sort of have an excess presentation. Um, muscle atrophy and paralysis, it's also quite good for. It may be a little bit more dispersing if you need to disperse. Um, microcurrent, usually better for healing injuries. Uh, weaker stimulants may be indicated in some cases, more deficient conditions, more deficient patients. Um, nerve damage works really well for neuropathy and um, other kinds of nerve damage. And it could be viewed as more tonifying, more healing. Um, and here's kind of my choice grid for mode. Uh, when would you choose continuous, discontinuous, or mixed mode? Um, commonly, continuous is used in pain conditions only, or in substance abuse, uh, where the patient wants to be sedated a bit. And so continuous can be kind of sedating. It's typically used at lower frequencies, um, and you watch for that tolerance buildup where you're having to turn it up for them to still feel something. Um, whereas discontinuous is used for a couple of very specific things, spasticity and edema. Um, and that's mostly what I use uh, discontinuous mode for. And then mixed, you can use it for a lot of things as well. Uh, pain, muscle atrophy, paralysis, neuropathy, hypertension, um, mixed mode is you get the less tolerance buildup and it works better over time. So choosing frequency, um, there's low and high. Um, low is going to be usually the 2 to 10 hertz range and we know what that does and I usually work in that range a lot. Higher frequency I use in certain cases, and especially with mixed mode. And here are some of the things that it does. Um, needle placement. Now this is getting into treatment, and we're going to talk about this a bit. Um, in general, we're only using disposable needles, of course. And metal handled needles work better than plastic. So um, I don't like to use sarin needles with electro. Some people do. You can attach clips to the shaft of the needle. But I like the metal handle and having the option of attaching to the metal handle. Um, typically, I'm using the 0.25 millimeter, the 32 gauge, or thicker needle, um, at least a one soon in length, because you want to have 
a little bit to attach to, and you also need to get in deep enough that the needle's going to stay in. So you want to have an insertion depth of at least a half soon, um, sometimes up to a one and a half soon. Uh, I've gone deeper, um, depending on what I'm treating. Twisting the needle, important. Twist the needle clockwise, get it stuck a little bit until you feel that. You want to get it in deep enough, touch the connective tissue, and then wrap that connective tissue around the tip of the needle. Get it stuck a little bit, and when it feels stuck, you can kind of you know, move it in and out, and it, it doesn't move the shaft of the needle in and out. It actually pulls the, the tissue up and down. That's where you want to be, then attach to it, and that'll stay in while, during the treatment. Uh, we talked about resistance earlier, and, and here I'm going to talk a bit about resistance of different human tissue. Um, resistance varies by person, gender, and tissue type, um, electrode size, and the placement in, uh, uh, of needles, and the frequency that you're using. Um, so skin resistance is in the range of 1,000 to 10 or 100,000 ohm. So it can be pretty high, and that's why TENS units use more intensity or a different waveform to penetrate through that skin resistance. Now we know that acupoints have a lower skin resistance and once you insert that needle in that point you get it you can really bring that resistance down to about 300 ohms. Um, so going through the tissue into the connective tissue really lowers the resistance uh, of the point. In human tissue, we know bone and fat have a much higher resistance than muscle, nerve, connective tissue, blood vessels, etc. have a much lower resistance to electrical current than bone and fat. So someone who's obese, it's going to be difficult to get a good connect. This is part of the reason it's difficult to treat obese patients with electroacupuncture because you're going to have to go so much deeper to get to the point where you lower that electrical resistance. And men generally have a lower resistance than women. Um, so men sometimes, it takes less to get a, get a response from them than women do. Just seems ironic, but it's true. <laughs> so here's a little uh, chart, a little diagram. Not a very good diagram, but it shows you the farther apart the needles are, the deeper the current penetrates. So if, you're, if the needles are pretty close together, the current stays pretty close to the surface. It's going to take the the path of least resistance to get through from one electrode to the other. Whereas it, once you start putting the needles farther apart, the electricity goes deeper, the current goes deeper into the tissue, and it becomes more unpredictable in a way. This is why uh, I really recommend keeping the needles fairly close together. I stay, you know, like on an extremity, I will stay on that extremity with the two needles. Um, or say I'm treating the back, I would go on one side of the back and go from the upper to the lower, you know, and stay within, you know, maybe uh, 10, 12 inches uh, of the needles maximum, closer in some cases, depending on what you're trying to do. But you don't want to have a treatment, say, from, uh, you know, the hand on uh, LI4 on one arm to uh, LI4 on the other arm because that's passing, for one thing, it's crossing the midline of the upper body, which is not a good idea, but it's passing through so many kinds of tissue and organs. Um, it becomes very unpredictable where the current is going to wind up, and so it's less effective, I think, as well, as being somewhat more dangerous. So keep the needles fairly close together. One of the frequently asked questions I get is, does it matter which clip, red or black, goes where? And, you know, some people recommend that you use the red more proximal, the black more distal, um, red head, black bottom. It's kind of the, the uh, mnemonic for that. However, I think with uh, uh, biphasic electroacupuncture, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, I kind of follow this rule of thumb just to kind of keep myself in check. But, um, it, you know, because it, the machines are biphasic, um, Red and black becomes less meaningful. So for pain, typically I'm picking an osher point where it hurts, and then another point or two nearby. 
uh, and then treating those two points with electro. Um, pain, you can also go Yang Ming Xiao Yang channel points because these are big muscle areas, right? Um, so they usually you can find within that area of the body some good points to treat. Muscle motor points also work well. Uh, you can try surrounding the painful area with four needles and then doing one channel with these two needles and another channel with the other two needles. So they're kind of crossing. There's different things you can do with pain. If it's localized, it's easy to just treat around the pain. For muscle atrophy, again, Yang Ming Xiao Yang channel on the affected uh, limb where the atrophy is. Muscle trigger, po muscle, or trigger points or muscle motor points are also work well for muscle atrophy. For paralysis and neuropathy, again, Yang Ming Xiao Yang. These are points you go back to over and over. Stomach 36, stomach 40, stomach 41, gallbladder 39, gallbladder 34, gallbladder 31, gallbladder 30. You're using a lot of those gallbladder points and, and stomach channel points, large intestinal points, triple burner. You're, these are the, the big points for musculoskeletal issues as well as for electroacupuncture. However, you can also treat the scalp. And so in scalp acupuncture, motor and sensory lines speech area for people with stroke. Um, so you're usually, you're staying on one side and you're just treating the scalp. Huato Jaji and your urinary bladder uh, treatments for back issues. And you, again, you're staying on one side or the other. So you go from upper to lower, right? You don't go across. And um, you're gonna treat the appropriate spinal segment that's, that's having the problem. Intensity is generally attuned to the patient's comfort or tolerance. So you turn it up until the patient says, oh, I feel that. And then you ask them, can you, is it, is it comfortable? Could I turn it up a little more? And they may say, oh yeah, I'll turn it up more. And you turn it up, it's like, oh, that's a little too much. And you turn it back down. Typically, that's the way you gauge the, the, the patient's tolerance. You get it to, oh, that's a little uncomfortable, and then turn it down from there. Uh, you want to do this very slowly so that you're never you know, startling them with this, with this part of the treatment. And then you leave it for 10 to 30 minutes, usually about 20 minutes. Um, longer for more chronic conditions, nerve damage, neurology patients, things like that, more people are more excess, shorter treatments for more acute conditions and more deficient patients. So for the first, um, I recommend that if you have never used an electroacupuncture device before or never used it, you have a new device you've never used before, that you first start by practicing sort of the mechanics of how it's used on an inanimate object. Um, a massage table works really well for this, treatment table of any kind, or a pillow or some other object that you can put a couple needles in. And you can see here, I've put a couple needles in this table so I'm going to get out my device and the clip leads. And what I've done is I've put two needles. They're about six, seven inches apart in this table. These are one and a half soon needles, and they're inserted, as you can see, probably about a half to uh, three quarters of a soon. So then, taking the device, you connect it up, put it in, plug it into a channel, and you're going to attach the clip leads. And here I'm going to attach to the shaft of the device, or the shaft of the needle. <clears throat> and you'll notice I'm attaching it not near the surface, but up the shaft of the needle. You don't want the, the clip lead touching the patient's skin. You want it to be maybe a, a quarter to a half an inch above the skin. So now that I have the clip leads attached, I'm going to, um, if I were treating an actual patient, I would tell the patient, Okay, now I'm going to stimulate this point and this point. And I always touch near the needle to tell them where they're going to feel the stimulation. Then I've set my parameters. I'm going to do a mixed treatment, 2 to, 10, to uh, 100 hertz. I'm going to set the timer, and I'm going to turn the machine on to mixed frequency. So I've got mixed mode, 2 to 100 hertz. And we're only treating one set of needles here, so channel one is now going to be turned on. So a little click, and I'm going to turn it up. 
And with a real patient, you would probably turn it up until the patient said, oh, I feel something, or you start to see needle movement, or um, the patient says, oh, that's enough, that you can turn it down now. And then I would turn it down just a little bit, and then you leave the treatment for the duration. This is a good place to practice. You're getting your skills down about your machine and how it operates, not, uh, not on a real patient, but on an inanimate object. So you can kind of see what's going on with your machine. Okay, then at the end of the treatment, you're gonna turn the knob down very slowly until it clicks off. And then you can turn the frequency knob or the mode knob down to off. So the entire machine is now turned off. Disconnect the clips, set the clip leads aside, set the device aside, remove the needles from your patient as you normally would. So I suggest you kind of practice using an inanimate object just to get down your skills of using the machine itself so you know how the controls work without hooking it up to a patient. The next step would be to try it on yourself. And in those cases, I would suggest maybe like triple burner five to uh, LI 10 on one arm, connect it up and see how that feels, see how it operates, see how the patient, in this case yourself, would respond as it is turned up. That'll give you an idea of how your machine works. And that's a good way to practice before you actually start treating patients. So for this portion, I'm gonna demonstrate scalp acupuncture and the use of uh, electroacupuncture with scalp needling. So in this case, I'm going to needle, let's needle the motor and sensory areas. Um, so finding the midpoint and then swapping the points. And then we'll do a little insertion. In this case, I'm gonna use a crossing technique where I'm gonna cross the motor and sensory line so it kind of saves a step. Um, one doesn't have to um, needle both lines. You can, you can cross them with the needles as well as you can go down the lines. So in this case, I'm just gonna put a few down the line, crossing. These are one and a half soon, 32 gauge, 0.25 millimeter needles. I'm using DBC needles. I like DBCs because they have the metal handles and they're easily inserted. So I think three is probably enough. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, need, we're gonna attach the electrodes from here to here. Be one circuit. Good okay? So, so you remember the rule is typically is that use the black distal and the red proximal. So going from the lower needle to the upper needle, I'm on channel one. So now I'm going to stimulate these two points. Tell me if you start to feel something, okay? So I turn the machine from off. I'm gonna use mixed frequency going from two to 100 hertz. This is the kind of treatment you would use for someone who had a stroke or other um, neurological issues involving the brain that were affecting motor sensory function. So now I'm gonna turn it on and I'm gonna slowly, and the key is slowly turn it up. Now I'm only gonna turn it up when it's on the higher of the mixed frequency. So when, it's, when that mixed frequency light comes on, that's when I'm turning it. Right up there. You feel that? Just a little, yeah. Okay. Very slight. Can I turn it up more? Oh yeah. Okay. So again, only when the mixed frequency light is on, because that's the higher frequency. Stop, and now, again, I'm turning it up very slowly. Feel that? Oh, yeah. Now, are you feeling two different sensations, like a, a, a slow and a fast pulsing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Sometimes the slower pulse is a little bit more subtle. Mm -hmm. 
than the fast pulse. And so, again, using mixed frequency, you have to be cautious about only turning it up when it's on the higher of the two frequencies, because if you turn it up when it's on the lower frequency, which again is more subtle, patient starts to feel something, but then the higher frequency kicks in and it's a stronger sensation, it can be kind of, kind of startling to the patient. But in this case, it feels okay, right? Okay, good. That's the sensation you want. Now, this is the kind of treatment you could leave in place for 20 minutes. You could leave it in place for half an hour on a stroke patient. You would probably also, at the same time, if the patient had a stroke, you would, at the same time you were treating the scalp, you would treat the affected side, typically left side stroke, right side paralysis and loss of sensation. You would treat the right side of the body at the same time you were treating the left side of the scalp. And you would use the same mixed uh, frequency. Uh, and, but on, in this case, when you're treating the body, you can look for muscle movement. You can look for needle movement. You can, the patient can feel something a little bit more strongly than they can on the scalp. But they should feel both. Okay. Then when the treatment's over after 20, 30 minutes, let the patient know, I'm going to turn this down now. Okay. And then you turn, slowly turn the channel down until you feel the resistance and then click it to the off position or the zero on the intensity dial. Then you can turn the mode knob to off. The entire machine is now shut down. And then you can remove the clips. Put the unit aside, remove the needles, and conclude the treatment as you normally would. So we're going to treat a patient here who's had a spinal cord injury um, at T4. Also had a compression at um, C8, C7, C8, C9, or T1. Is that where it was? Um, so this will be a Watojaji treatment. Um, and we're going to go from above the injured, injured area to below the injured area. We use one and a half soon needles. Um, again, these are the 0.25 or uh, 32 gauge. So I get a fairly deep insertion and I twist the needle. And I'm twisting it to kind of get it wrapped up in the connective tissue. And that has a couple of functions. One, it creates a stronger sensation, but it also keeps the needle in place during the electro part of the treatment. It's not so much an issue when a patient is lying down, but if you were treating a patient sitting in a wheelchair, which frequently you do with this kind of treatment, um, sometimes the needles will tend to pull out if the patient is vertical. <laughs> Been okay? Mm So when I'm winding it up, I'm kind of just twisting in one direction until I feel some tension, like the connective tissue is getting wound around the tip of the needle. Feel a little resistance there. Getting the needle stuck.
Can you tell if we've reached the area where your sensation changes? Mm -hmm, I'm getting close. Okay. This is what's called an incomplete spinal cord injury. So he has a lot of feeling and sensation below the injury, but there's a definite change right at the level of injury. should be there by now. Mm -hmm. So again, kind of making sure all these needles are a little bit stuck. Okay. So now we're going to use, with the Pantheon device, we're going to use microcurrent. So I'm going to take it out of the millicurrent jack and plug it in to the lower level microcurrent channel 1. I'm going to connect that on this side of the spine. And as you see, I'm still, the, the clips are not touching the skin. at least an eighth of an inch above the, the skin. Channel two will plug in to microcurrent. Connect those. Top and the bottom. So you see I'm going from top to bottom. The needles in between are kind of like little relays between the top and the bottom uh, electrodes we've got here. So then we're using microcurrent and I plug in, you know, I've used this machine a lot so I don't have to look, but if you're new to the Pantheon, you may want to actually pick the machine up, look, and make, make sure you're in the right plugs. If you want microcurrent, you're going to the lower um, row of uh, output jacks there. Okay. So again, I'm going to use mixed frequency. I'm going to set the, um, the upper frequency on 30, the lower frequency on 2. That's a nice one for microcurrent. And then with microcurrent, the patient is less likely to feel sensation. So as I turn it up, so as I turn these two up, it's not going to be, um, you don't have to go quite as slowly, but let me know if you feel something. So I'm turning up these two needles on the right first. Okay, so he felt something there. Very, it's a, it's a, it's a very mild sensation. Um, sometimes with microcurrent, the patient will say, "I think I feel something. I'm not sure," uh, and I always stop because uh, with the Pantheon device, I've got the intensity up to four. Um, so remembering, it goes up to 600 uh, microamps. So when you're six, you're on 600. Um, at four, you're probably around 350 or 400 microamps. That's a good setting. Um, that's effective for boosting the ATP, increasing the cellular uh, protein synthesis. So it's, it's having healing effects um, even though the patient doesn't feel very much. And that's what you want to go for. And now I'm going to turn up the two electrodes on the left side. Again, let me know if you feel something. And I'm only turning this up when it's on the mixed, even though it's microcurrent, I, I adhere to this rule. But you can turn it up a little faster than you do with millicurrent. Turning, feel something there? Yeah. Okay. 
So he felt a little faster on the left side than he did on the right side. That could have to do with the amount of sensory neurons that are still intact on the left side. It could have to do with needle placement. Um, who knows? He felt it a little sooner on that side. So I just leave it there. And so this treatment um, is good for healing in spinal cord injuries. It's good for pain reduction because a lot of times with injuries like this, you have a lot of pain around the level of injury and just above the level of injury. So typically that's where the spinal cord patient will have the most pain and discomfort is right at the injury level and just above it where the, the neurons are still intact. And so in this case, we're treating both pain and the uh, dysfunction that he has at this level. Now this could be combined with um, uh, treatment of the extremities, the arms and the legs, or the portions of the body that are affected, in this case with a thoracic injury. It's mostly lower body that's affected, so you could treat the legs with millicurrent at the same time you're treating the back with microcurrent. Uh, I would not use millicurrent on the back because you really don't want to overstimulate the muscles along where the injury is. Uh, you could, if there's an unstable spinal segment, it could pull that uh, and create a subluxation where there was, would not have been one otherwise. Or if there's an area that tends to subluxate easily, you could actually, if you used a millicurrent, you could cause it to happen. Uh, so using microcurrent is much safer uh, with unstable spinal areas. And again, we're trying to help heal. We're trying to help restore function uh, to damaged nerve tissue, so microcurrent is much better for that purpose. This part I'm going to demonstrate treating the lower legs, and so in this case, again, we're, we have a patient here who has um, has spinal cord injury. We're going to treat some do some lower leg treatment. He does have some movement in his lower legs, but you know muscle tone is is obviously affected. And um, do you have sensation, mm -hmm. normal sensation? You think or Reduced. No pain, no thermal, but everything else is normal. Okay. So he has no pain in this area, but he has, and no thermal, so you can't feel heat or cold. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to use a couple of UB channel points. I'll go from maybe 40. UB57. Now, when you're treating the legs, you could all, you know, often you're, you're using Yang Ming channel points or Xiao Yang. So there's gallbladder 39, uh, gallbladder 34, stomach 36, stomach 41, stomach 40. You could choose any of those points and, and use electroacupuncture. But since our patient is face down, and we're continuing with the Watteau treatment. I'm just going to treat uh, the UB channel here. I think this is also complements the uh, Watteau treatment we're doing quite nicely. So in this case, because we're treating the extremities, we're going to use millicurrent. So I'm choosing channel 3 on the, on the device, and I'm hooking up millicurrent. So I'm using the millicurrent jacks, the upper, upper level of output jacks. And channel 4. Okay. 
Still feeling that in your neck at all? Um, Nothing? Not. Yeah, and that's fine. With microcurrent, um, I'm not really concerned about whether or not he's feeling it. Um, and so, in fact, that's kind of the downfall of microcurrent is convincing the patient that something's happening because often it's subsensory, and in fact, it works better if it's subsensory. Uh, you really don't want to have a lot of sensation or needle movement or anything like that with microcurrent. You want to build up the energy in those cells, not be depleting them by having muscle contractions. Um, so in this case, we're running the microcurrent through the Watteau points around the level of injury in his spinal cord, but in the extremities, we're going to want to create more stimulation. We actually want him to feel the treatment that we're doing in his legs. So here I'm going to use millicurrent and I'm going to start out on the left side. I'm going to stimulate these two needles. Can you feel that where I'm touching? And we're going to start turning it up. You let me know when you feel something. And you want to look at the needles occasionally, too, because you might actually see some needle movement. But I'm only turning it up when the mixed light is on. Feel something? A little bit. Okay, he's feeling a little bit. I've got it up, half, up to three. I'm going to turn it up a little bit more. How's that? You still feel it? Is it comfortable? Yes. Could I go up a little more? Sure. Okay, here we go. A little bit more. Now you're starting to see needle movement. So you can actually see um, some muscle contraction happening there. And actually his toe is moving as well. Is that comfortable? Yeah. You sure? Okay. I want to make sure it's comfortable. So that's left side. Now we're going to go to the right side. Same two points. Other side. Again, let me know when you start to feel something. Again, I'm only turning it up when the mixed frequency light is on. So when the higher frequency is running. Whoa. That little movement. Are you feeling that? No. You're not feeling it. So we caused a movement, maybe just a reflex, even though he wasn't feeling it. And I can see muscle contraction now. Can you feel that? Do you have reduced sensation on this side no. compared to the other? There's a fairly dramatic muscle contraction going on there. That's in the lower frequency, though. Can you catch that on the? So once I see that amount of contraction going on, I'm hesitant to, to go any further with the um, with the intensity because he's already getting some reaction. Um, it could be just this side is, is it fires more easily than the other side, or it could be with a slight variation in needle placement, we're getting a, a better reaction over here. So this is the kind of treatment I would typically do with a spinal cord injury, um, treating the Watojaji with microcurrent and treating the extremities with millicurrent. We could also treat the, uh, the arms with millicurrent as well. Um, if he were in a chair, sometimes you treat people with spinal cord injuries sitting in a chair. You could treat uh, like cervical Huato Jaji points um, and leg points and arm points as well. Uh, with paraplegics, it's easier a lot of times to have them lie down and do this. You could also do it in a chair. With quadriplegic, it's often easier to do it in the chair because then you can treat the cervical area, the arms and the legs all at the same time. And you can treat more of the Yang Ming Xiaoyang points in the arms and legs at the same time you're doing the Huato Jaji.
for the cervical area. So again, microcurrent on the Huato, millicurrent on the extremities works really well. Um, these muscles get a workout while the spinal cord is having a chance to do some extra healing. And because the signals are all similar, you know, the signal goes up and when it gets to that part that's damaged, it's trying to break through in the, uh, in the damaged area of the spine. And that is part of the healing process, I believe, is that uh, you're sending a signal up through the spinal tract uh, to try to break through the injured area. That helps it to heal. Okay, so once you're finished uh, with uh, the treatment, um, you know, you, would, you could let this run for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, at the end, you would tell the patient, okay, I'm going to start turning these down. I'm going to turn down the legs first. You don't have to turn them down as slowly as you turn them up. And the other one. And then I'm going to turn down the Huato. And then I'm going to just turn each of them off. I turn them down until I feel that resistance right before it hits zero, and then turn them all off at once, clicking them to off, um, and then turning the mode to off as well. And now I'm just going to de take the, the wires off, take the needles out, and end the treatment as you would normally end any treatment. So at the end of the day, when you're um, putting your equipment away, it's really important to remember that the electroacupuncture equipment also comes in contact with patients. It might not be direct contact, but you're touching the patient, you're touching the machine. Uh, the patient is in, in the same room, and you know, likely you know, any pathogens that are around would also get on the machine. So like all of your equipment, you want to periodically clean it. I'm going to use um, a Santa White, or what's this called? It's a Santa Cloth Plus germicidal disposable cloth. This is a, you know, nothing that's going to really this is not going to come in direct contact with the patient, so it doesn't need to be sterilized or anything like that, but just to wipe it down. Um, and this should be done, I think, daily in clinic when these are in use. Uh, make sure you're wiping them down really well. Um, if you're sensitive to these things, you might want to wear gloves to do this, but I found I'm not very sensitive to these. so. Just wipe the unit down, the entire outside of the case. And the other thing is the wire, which does come in contact with the patient often. Um, and just giving it a, a good wipe too. And the little clips. Just good practice. And then we're going to put this away in its bo storage box. And I'm going to um, take my clips. And this is the way I do this, very loosely wind them up, make a little bunch, and then tie them up with a twisty. Put that in the box, put the lid on the box, close it up, and then it's good to go. It won't, the box protects the unit, uh, keeps it safe until the next time you use it.